Call the roll. Senator Bass. Here. Senator uh, Representative McLean. Here. Representative Carson. Here. And Representative Trudeau. We'll start off by uh, introductions. Uh, each of us have a few opening remarks. Senator Bass. Thank you and good morning. It's great to uh, serve. I know all of you serve in many ways. Uh, great people of Lake County. Uh, I am your senator still and uh, grateful to also be the uh, president pro tem of the Florida Senate. So this should be good for Lake County as so I work for you and uh, also West Orange County. So I uh, operate from all the way up to the river at the uh, northeast corner of the county, all the way down to Disney World. So it's an exciting uh, venue. A lot of things are happening for you. Thank you for all the work you're doing and bringing to us today for discussion. Representative Clinton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Daniel Clayton. I'm the uh, House District 27. Redistricting. I currently did serve House District 23, which was half Marion County for my first three terms in the House, and then this will be my last term in the House. But uh, so I have part of Bay, part of Lake, and part of Volusia. Uh, not new to the process, obviously, and so uh, uh, it's honored to be here. It's honored to be able to represent all of you. And looking forward to working with the delegation members, and uh, looking looking forward to working with you as well. Thank you, Representative McCarthy. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Taylor Yarkoski, and I have the great honor of representing District 25 down in South Lake County. Uh, it's an honor to sit up here with uh, Chairman McClain and Drew now and Senator Baxley, and uh, just very grateful to the voters of South Lake County for giving me this greatest honor of my life to, uh, to serve in this county that I've called home for almost 20 years now. Uh, looking forward to learning and, and being a part of uh, turning, continuing to turn our delegation what I, I see as the most powerful role in the United States. So God bless you and thanks for being here today. Thank you. And I'm Representative Trudeau. This year I chaired the delegation and I'm honored to do so. With the amount of folks that show up here today, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. I know a lot of you can't make it to Tallahassee to, to voice your concerns about issues that you may have. This venue is for that. So that you can get up and tell your story and, and remind us what things that you're looking for and, and how it affects your life. Um, I think we'll have a very productive legislative session this year. Um, I think it got kicked off early. And uh, I think uh, everyone here has got lots going on and lots to do. So we appreciate all of you for being here today. So with that, I'm going to I would like to recognize any, any elected official from the county or, or cities and, and, and that are here today, if you wouldn't mind standing and, and we'll show you our appreciation.
So next time we have a meeting, uh, Senator Maxis will be chair. Um, so another little bit of housekeeping here. The Lake County Legislative Delegation Rules of Procedure. The rules of the day. Uh, each, each speaker will have three minutes and uh, we'll have a, a timer over here to keep up with your time. There, there are a lot of folks that are going to speak today, so we have to keep it you know, within those time limits because we'll, we might be here all day and all night if we don't. So um, just be uh, mindful of that as we move forward. Another housekeeping thing we need to do uh, is, is the bylaws. At this time, members and I would like to start a process in reviewing and certifying the bylaws annually. Uh, you guys have been provided the bylaws for today's meeting, and we'd like to make this uh, an ongoing every year event that we talk about the bylaws and make sure that we're adopting those and using them accordingly. So I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have. Thank you very much. So, first item agenda for today is the uh, presentation of a local bill by Representative Garkowski. The topic today is the Lake County Rural Protection Areas. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> so this is, uh, uh, this is a local bill that one of the things that I talked a lot about was campaigning is you know, protecting the way of life that we have in Lake County, protecting the, the climate, the integrity, the pristineness, um, and you know, not allowing us to turn into something that we don't necessarily want our kids to grow up in. And I think a lot of that comes with responsible uh, growth and making sure we're protecting the things that matter. Not not to say we're not going to do things. It's just. Uh, some extra layers to make sure that I say all the time our job is to get it right not for any one person But just get it right period and I think that what we're doing here will, will lead to us making sure we're getting it right um, I'm going to read this um, And in our master plan in Lake County we have three areas that are rural protection areas the Wakaiva Ocala rural protection area up in uh, more in the uh, Representative McLean's area, we have Emeralda Marsh Rural Protection Area here in the central part, and then over in my district, Yulaha Lake Apopka Rural Protection Area. They're part of the master plan. And <clears throat> let me read this. It says, uh, rural lands and rural lifestyles are intrinsic, inalienable parts of the character, history, culture, and quality of life within Lake County. The preservation of rural land and sustainable agriculture and forestry contributes to the conservation of natural resources. The local bill seeks to protect three core rural areas described as rural protection areas and shall be recognized and preserved by the county and all municipalities within the geographic boundaries of Lake County. Uh, essentially what we're, what we're saying here, and, and language is, is going to be coming out soon when it's filed, you guys will be able to read it, but um, essentially what we're saying is if uh, to annex into the role of rural protection areas and do anything, uh, we're going to require you to enter into a joint planning agreement with the county and make sure that we're <clears throat> we're thinking these projects through and we're getting the densities and and any projects you know right. Like I said, get it right. So again, we're not necessarily saying no to anything. We're just saying we want to make sure we have another layer on that to protect these rural areas that I think in a big way lead to the, the way of life that we love here in Lake County, and I certainly appreciate it, and I want to protect that. So, uh, without any, uh, there's anything else, Chairman, I think that kind of sums it up. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bukarski. Uh, Representative McLean, you have anything you'd like to add to that? Senator Maxson? No, I, I think <coughs> if you entertain a motion, I'll make one go for you, because I think it's good. Well, we have a motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Okay. Looking forward on this bill, as things roll out, we'll be able to follow as a, as a blueprint to, to some le legislation that will um, help preserve 
the, these protection areas in the future. So I think it's a step in the right direction for uh, the conversation we had. So we'll keep you in touch, keep in touch, and, and keep the information flowing towards you when it comes. Yes. Question on this: um, When you say about annex and MRL, would you cut the photo? This has nothing to do with why I'm here today, but I'm a native of born in that hospital out there. So my question, when you talk about the annex and MRL to Island, what is that? So there's three rural protection areas that already exist in the county's plan. We're just using those plans and, and saying that the conversation has to be had with the municipalities that may annex them into a city or... Uh, so no building in Emerald Island, correct? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Okay. Thank you for that question. So we'll move on to local government presentations. And first, first on deck is Chairman Smith. Mm -hmm. Have another question? Oh, one second, please, sir. Good morning. My name is McFarland. I'm with Howard Women Hills. And um, I am absolutely for the preservation of our rural protection areas. Um, I do want to say that the current map that disproportionately affects Howie, over 50% of our ISBA is included in this. And though we say that we have to have conversations with the county, excuse me, coffee in my throat, um, we haven't been that successful with that conversation. And an example is Great Point, which was just approved. A very, very high density development in a rural protection area in, in the middle of very sparsely populated um, communities. And so I do appreciate that this needs to move forward. I'm very happy that it's moving forward, but I would really ask that when we scrutinize this map, we look at the impact that it's going to have on a, a town's ability to be able to annex appropriately and um, then work with developers and builders in those areas. Thank you for your comments. <coughs> Chairman, do you mind if I make a quick comment? Yes. Uh, Mayor, thank you for that. I just want to say one thing, and that is that um, going forward, I intend to, to be, be a part of some of these conversations. I know that we um, you know, I think leadership in this area is a big thing, and this is very important to me. So I understand your concern, and I promise you it will get attention, and we will be thinking it through at all levels. And uh, so thanks for your comment, Mayor. Okay, I'm just, there's a lot going on here today. So I've got a few people that have turned in a card for today to talk about the local bill. So I have a, a Cindy Newton. Do you wish to speak? Thank you. You waved this board? Okay. Uh, Patricia Duncan? Same thing. Okay, thank you. Um, Lee? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Deborah Shelley? There she goes. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Senator Baxley, uh, Representatives Bruno, McLean, and Grakowski. Uh, I am Deborah Shelley. Uh, I live on East Dewey, Roberts Road, Howie in the Hills, uh, unincorporated Lake County. Um, and my family and I live in the Alaha Lake Apopka Rural Protection Area. So thank you so much for presenting this legislation. I am here this morning to support the RPA legislation. Thank you for reading the uh, information from the comprehensive plan defining the intrinsic value and all that. I, I really appreciate that as well. I'd just like to say that we need this legislation to move forward and the joint planning areas to get a better handle on preserving our rural uh, zone land. So I know you're aware of that. Uh, we, I know we can't protect all our rural areas, but I believe the cities adjacent to the RPAs have other ample lands that are available to expand the municipal boundaries. 
As a resident of the RPA, um, I support the surrounding towns and cities economically, uh, as do my rural neighbors, and we choose to live in a rural area, but we also have respect for other lifestyles, uh, be they in town, in suburbia, or in the larger cities. Um, the rural zoning category is a category that should be maintained just like any other zoning category uh, to maintain the diversity of lifestyles within uh, the county. Um, and we hope that they are not just seen as areas waiting for the next subdivision and hundreds of 45 acre, 45 foot lots. Um, we're very concerned that we're heading um, in a direction uh, towards suburbia and having a majority of the county urban or suburban if we don't do something different now. So I greatly appreciate that you move um, this legislation forward during the session and thank you for your consideration of that. And I would just like to mention that I don't think Great Point is in the Alaha Lake of Popular Rural Protection Area. I am very familiar with that boundary because I live in that area, so please check that uh, during your discussions. Thank you. Thank you for your information. Okay, back on the local government presentations. Chairman Smith. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to um, speak before you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say it's a great day for Lake County. Thank you for your service. Um, I see that this is going to be a, a very good year for Lake County uh, for the next few years because of representation we have within the city. So thank you very much. Uh, these are our legislative priorities. I'm going to go through them real quick. Um, I will be up in Tallahassee to go more in depth with them in the next month or two to talk to each one of you about these priorities. So uh, the first one is the South Lake Trail Boardwalk Replacement Multi-Use Improvement. This boardwalk was built in 2007 and has uh, gone through its useful life. The next one is the Neighborhood Lake Scenic Trail and Trailhead Improvements. This would be for some provisions, uh, water fountains, and make it ADA accessible uh, for all the citizens of Lake County. Then we have the Golden Triangle East Campus <coughs> Park. Uh, this is a park located very less than a quarter mile from Eustis and less than a quarter mile from Mount Hola. It will serve the vast majority of people in District 3, Central Florida. Uh, we feel that this is a, a huge improvement for our parks and a uh, recreation lifestyle for our citizens. Um, we have a fire station that was uh, built in a residential area. It was a volunteer fire station back in the 80s. Um, we were going to do some repairs on it, but the repairs would not be a good investment return on investment. The county does own some land on Highway 44 or County Road 44. Uh, we're going to be asking for appropriations to build a new fire station that will help that area out there through the studies. And we have noticed that uh, our call volume would decrease uh, or our call response time would decrease and it would be uh, better for the citizens of Pine Lakes Northeast area. Uh, we also have a request for uh, assistance in purchasing bear proof trash cans. Uh, to date, we have assisted 2,324 people with bear proof trash cans. Uh, there are 848 people on the waiting list uh, for this request, and so we can help purchase uh, those bear proof trash cans. As you know, uh, North Lake County has a lot of white bears, and it's becoming a problem as more development comes in, they're pushing more into the neighborhood. Uh, of course, you've heard about the rural protection area. I'll be coming to you to talk about the expanded use of tourist development tax to allow certain aspects to put the smaller counties on the same playing field as the larger counties. Um, so we can use those uh, funding for engineering, study, um, infrastructure use. And the last thing I have, if you allow me 15 more seconds, is um, we'll be coming to you to talk to you about regulation of marijuana facilities, uh, not the distribution, but the noise and the lighting and how it's proposed. So I appreciate your time, and I'll be anxious to meet with you in the next month or so to go over these in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith. 
for that information. Next, we'll move on to the superintendent of Lake County Schools, Diane Cornegate. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I just want us to begin by saying thank you for your support of Lake County Schools and of our students. So looking back quickly at the accomplishments we made together this past session, I want to thank you for your support of our appropriation for $350,000 to expand our career and technical education aviation programs to two more Lake County high schools. <coughs> like our construction academies that were supported by previous appropriation, Lake County school students have increased opportunities to explore career fields and earn industry certifications that will lead to high wage, high demand jobs here in our community. Students participating in the aviation programs are earning their private pilot certifications and their commercial drone certifications. And in one year, the program grew from 198 students to over 300. Our aviation open house held in December conflicted with your special session on property insurance and property tax. But I want to extend to you an open invitation to visit our programs at South Lake High School, Eustis High School, and East Ridge High School to see the impacts of your work on our students. <laughs> and Representative, Representative True now, I know that you will be particularly excited to know that next school year we will start our very first agriculture drone operations program at Umatilla High School. So looking ahead to this coming session, you will notice that our priorities once again focus on sustainable funding for the district. Like last session, we were successful in getting back our compression funding in the amount of $2.65 million, thanks to your support. However, Lake County still remains below the statewide average in student funding, and we ask your continued support to increase these total funds compression to bring Lake County up to 100% of the state average and make the appropriation a permanent part of the FBFP. Our greatest challenge, like every other school district in the state and across our nation, has been hiring and retaining teachers as well as our non-instructional personnel. The governor's commitment to provide and the legislator's appropriation to the teacher salary increase funds the past two years has increased the starting salary, and Lake County is now above the state average. <coughs> this is a major step forward, and it's something that we all need to celebrate. But now we need to focus our salary increases for veteran teachers, as well as our hard to fill positions, such as our bus drivers. Your help in providing districts the additional flexibility we need by increasing the funds to the base student allocation will help to address these needs. Because it is so critically important to teacher recruitment and retention, our major ask this year is not for an appropriation, but rather language changes specific to teacher certification. These are listed on the legislative priorities, so I will not read them here to you. But I welcome any opportunity to meet with you or members of your team to talk about some of the requests that we have in regards to additional time for certification requirements as well as changes to certification requirements themselves. These will just make sense and will reduce much of the stress that face our teachers. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you today and I look forward to continuing the conversation on behalf of students of Lake County Schools. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, next we'll have Lake Sumter State College President Dr. Regard. Good morning and happy new year. I'm, I'm so excited to be here with you today and uh, truly a privilege of being the president of Lake Sumter State College. And I'm excited to share with you that we'll be celebrating our 16th anniversary this year. Lake Sumter State College is growing in response to our rapidly growing community and we have a plan to serve the current and projected additional 100,000 or more additional residents that we'll call Lake County home over the next few years. This requires um, a shift in programs and facilities to meet the 21st century demand for workforce development. Our current Leesburg campus facilities have aged over the last 60 years to the extent that we have moved out of some of our current buildings as they are no longer conducive to the learning environment. Although we sought to renovate some of our spaces, we found that due to their age and the post-pandemic cost of materials, it would cost as much as 40% more to renovate compared to constructing new. Therefore, I'm here today to ask you for your support to construct a 50,000 square foot workforce development center that will replace three of our aging buildings and provide a net savings of over $300,000 per year. The workforce development center will expand our capacity to provide new programs in STEM, such as logistics, cybersecurity, robotics, augmented and virtual reality, gaming and animation, 
instruction, and teacher education. The new space will be a center for career exploration and an intersection of business and industry with students seeking opportunities for internships, apprenticeship, and entrepreneurship opportunities. It will also provide students with the access to the support services they need to be successful, whether it's tutoring or library research, job preparation, hands-on simulation, or meetings and workshops to reskill for a new career. The, work the Workforce Development Center will be the new hub of campus activity, where students, alumni, community members, and local employers will collaborate and innovate to propel economic mobility and create the talent pipeline that Lake County needs. Our total request is for $17.5 million in additional appropriations this year. We want to be good partners in economic development and good stewards of the resources and facilities provided by the state of Florida. We believe this facility will help us achieve both of those objectives. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, is the Workforce Development Center, is it in the PICO, is it in PICO, in the PICO planning, on the PICO planning list, and if so, where is it, right? It will be on our CIP, so what, what we went through last year was adding renovations for two of our facilities to achieve this objective, but we since found over the summer, after the submission of our documents, that the cost to renovate these buildings is going to be cost prohibitive versus constructing a new facility. So we're in the process of making that shift so that we can better represent our priorities. So this will be ranked as our number one priority in the revision. Thank you. So up next, we have the uh, mayor of the city of Tiberi, Walter Price.
of our land for conservation and agriculture. Our economic development climate. While we are committed to be, a great, to be great stewards of our natural assets and respect our heritage, we are also committed to a robust economy with job opportunities. Our Christopher C. Ford Commerce Park has grown exponentially from less than 1 million square feet of industrial space just a few years ago to nearing 5 million square feet due to growing demand in e-commerce and distribution warehouses. With Kroger and Amazon alone, we have added almost 2,000 jobs and have an additional 3 million square feet in development. State Road 50, a formal project development of environment study conducted more than a decade ago, clearly showed a need for the pairs of one-way lanes on State Road 50 to be replaced with a new four-lane truck route just three blocks north of the current State Road 50. The Florida Department of Transportation then responded with funding of a $2 million design phase to engineer the project. That design was completed in 2017. Since then, the city of Groveland has worked through the process to gain funding for purchase of the properties for the right-of-way of the new alignment. While we have been a patient and strong partner, there is a time when even the most staunch supporter becomes a critic. All right, then I am going to leave the rest and just tell you my feelings. I have lived in Groveland for close to 17 years. This was started back then. It's time we get it done. I have, unfortunately, no video today because I do have a thumb drive to show you actual footage from drones above State Road 50, 19, and 33. I would like to meet with each of you personally and continue this discussion. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that ends the local government presentation. We're going to move to public testimony. We have uh, Lake County Education Association, Kathy Smith. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Um, yes, I'm with Lake County Education Association, but this is my 43rd year in education. <coughs> I have been anywhere from a teacher's assistant and then teaching in elementary and middle school, kindergarten through grade eight. I appreciate the honor to speak with you today, and thank you for your commitment to Florida. Florida's public school educators are among the highest in the nation for beginning salary, but remains near the bottom for average teacher salary. Even with the increases in funding, the average teacher salary is 48th in the nation. The beginning teacher salary has risen due to the increased funding. Thank you so much. But raises for more experienced teachers have decreased due to the restrictions on how compensation can be distributed and has developed a compression issue. In real dollars, educators earn less than they did 10 years ago. It is time to use some of Florida's surplus for public education and Lake County. Public school educators and students have proven through test scores how valuable they are, so please help and continue to increase the base student allocation. Do not take away our freedom to decide what to do with our own money and limit our freedom to come together to advocate for our profession and our students. Teachers need respect. Respect the rights of public schools to make their own local decisions. Expand the financial investments in our public schools and allocate sufficient funds for all educators to receive fair and equitable <coughs> compensation. Students deserve a world-class education with highly qualified and certified teachers. Provide all schools the statutory flexibility granted to charter schools and provide teacher-led assessments. Ensure students have qualified educators by providing experienced teachers the opportunity to earn long-term contracts so the best of the best stay with our Florida students. Certification fees need to be waived or lowered. 
teachers need respect. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear. Next, we'll have Child Link Nature Center, Aileen Tromtonic. Is that right? That's the Tromtonic. Tromtonic. Okay. It looks worse than it is. <coughs> Thank you for having me. For several years, I've appeared before this delegation to ask for support for legislative appropriation to expand Trout Lake Nature Center's education capacity and facility. We've come close in the past, and we hope this year we'll be successful in getting that appropriation. In addition to supporting our facility improvements, we're asking you to support the implement implementation and use of environmental education throughout the state, our schools, agencies, and nonprofits. We need more and better environmental education that connects people and nature for the benefit of both. A recent survey by the <coughs> found that 70% of respondents, both the majority of both parties, believe that Florida schools should teach the causes, consequences, and solutions to climate change and other natural resource issues in K-12 schools. Being one of the leading states for being one of the leading states for environmental education in the past, Florida has fallen woefully behind in developing and delivering environmental education to its students, residents, and visitors. Trout Lake is concerned and is part of the solution. We provide student learning experiences at our facilities, provide busing grants for local schools, and provide input into Florida's draft environmental education literacy plan. We provide professional development. We are a statewide sponsors of the Project WET, which is Water Education for Today, which is an international program. <laughs> Through partnering with Gulf Coast University and other organizations, we've also developed a NOAA Be Wet grant, which will deal with teaching climate literacy throughout the state of Florida. Environmental education and literacy can be a powerful solution, but it provides, because it provides knowledge, develops workforce skills, and encourages a mindset of problem solving, and motivates individual and community partnerships and actions. Our country, our state, our county are facing many environmental challenges affecting our everyday lives, our families, our jobs, our communities, and even our health. Solutions often require an awareness and an understanding of the complex systems and the interdependence of people and the natural environment. For 35 years, this is our 35th year, the Trout Lake Nature Center has been working to educate, inspire, and protect. Our mission is to conserve and protect the natural environment and educate about its importance. For the past eight years, we have conducted over 500 field trips, reaching approximately 216,000 students. 232,000 people have visited our facility and participated in our programs, letting us touch a little less than half a million people directly within only 2.5 staff. Education is proposed as a part of the solution to many of our resource challenges. We request that you support and promote funding, the expansion of our education complex, and more and better environmental education throughout the state to return to Florida to its former position as one of the best environmental education in the nation. Thank you for that period. Thank you very much. Next we have uh, Jamie Perma. Yep. Or Good morning. How are you? Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. My name is Jamie Karna. I am a first grade teacher in the county schools. I live in Lady Lake and I have a child uh, who is currently in 11th grade. So I'm very invested in public education. And I was right my brain last night trying to think of what area do I want to speak to you about? And nerves were getting to me. I'm used to talking to little kids, <laughs> not adults. And I thought I could come up here and kind of trauma dump and say all the things that are wrong with education and everything that's wrong. And we know a lot of that. We don't have specifics if we're not in education. We don't know the exact trials and tribulations of not just teachers. Our families are suffering. Our children. Our students are suffering. We've all been through a lot these past three years. And my first thought was, I want to go about it with the students, because that, that's my most important issue, are my, my students. I have 19 students, all very diverse, all very unique. But I can tell you honestly that every single one has 
some issues they're struggling with. Family issues, mental health issues. There's a lot, and I can give you detailed stories and try to pull up the heartstrings. And I was nervous to come up and speak because I have been of the mindset, I'll admit, that are politicians going to listen? Do they want to listen to us? And I can tell you, Senator Baxley, um, I went to your office in February, I believe it was of last year, and that was a huge mindset for me because I know there's been a lot of us against them. And we spoke with your aide, and she mentioned, that I believe it was your daughter as a teacher, or your daughter-in-law, and I can tell you, that was a light bulb. It was like, no, he gets it. He, we may not be politically see eye to eye, we might not see eye to eye on a lot of things, but that, this is something we can be eye to eye on. And I thought, you know, I've got to change my mindset. I've got to, we've got to stop this us against them. We're all in this together. We're parents, we're community members, we're teachers. We all want what's best for the students. That's the bottom line. And so I'm a big proponent of don't just come with a problem, come with a solution. And this is the solution I would like to propose and ask for. I would like a line of communication with all of you. I would love to locally meet. I would love, I have a son at college in Tallahassee, so I need to go see him and come meet. I feel like if there were more communication and more building of relationships, like we're encouraged to do with our students, I feel that that would be a huge benefit to everyone involved. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Here we are citizens legislators. We're all citizens just like you. Um, feel free to call our offices and and set up appointments. If you're in Tallahassee, that's great. Um, even here in the district, um, we need your input. So thank you for that. Next, we have uh, Scott Chevalier from Powerhouse. Well, good morning. <clears throat> Thank you guys for this opportunity. Um, my name is Scott Chevalier, and I am a hope dealer. I'm also the founder of the Powerhouse Youth Project that changes the trajectory of students' lives by instilling passion and purpose. So when I hear a parent, a teacher speak, just like that one, I can applaud the efforts of them as a parent and as a teacher. I wanted to start this morning by talking about two people in history, one of which you and I in this room would consider a great leader in American history. As a matter of fact, he helped us through the Depression, President Herbert Hoover, and he said these words in his inaugural address. Our youth are our most priceless national asset. I think everybody in this room would applaud that. There's also a great tyrant in history who said some words from across the great pond that should really set off alarms in this room today. And he said this, whoever has the youth has the future. Those are the words spoken by Adolf Hitler in Germany. We have a crisis in our community today. We have a generation of students who have become numb to the necessity of education. They have experienced a worldwide pandemic crisis and they are now reevaluating their path forward after this crisis. Students today simply want to know why. Mike Rowe from the famous show Dirty Job said this, we are churning out a generation of poorly educated people with no skill, no ambition, no guidance, and no realistic expectation of what it means to go to work. I think I hear the employers across Lake County saying amen. But I don't believe he's just talking about vocational education. I believe our students need inspiration to reach their full potential. They need an injection of hope so they can rise above the situations and the poor examples of leadership in their homes, on TikTok, and within our communities. Powerhouse believes three basic premises. Number one, every student has a passion and a purpose. I think we all would agree with that this morning. Everyone needs someone to achieve it. If you look around this room, none of us in this room got here today by yourself. And number three, every choice will cost you something. Young people need to believe that they can succeed no matter, no matter what the obstacles or the failures that stand in their way. Youth can be taught grit, but hope can only be taught and caught 
through the expression of intentional methods to inspire them beyond their current situation and circumstances. You see, information today without inspiration does not bring transformation. They need to be inspired. The Powerhouse Youth Project provides a pathway to purpose. We are a supplement to students to help them achieve their potential and change the direction of their lives. What is the cost? The return on investment? One in four children in America today do not know how to read at a proficient level. Children who do not know how to read by the third grade are four times more likely to drop out of school. Eighty percent of those incarcerated today in our prison system are high school dropouts. Ninety percent of those today on the welfare system our high school dropouts. What is the cost? It cost you and I $28,000 to incarcerate a young man and young woman for one year. If we can save one student over the course of their lifetime, I found the money to build Dr. Brigard's building. I think we all can do something to inspire our young people, and I encourage us all to do that. Finally, I would say this. True at Kathy, where we drive to his restaurants every day, called Chick-fil-A, had it right. It is easier to raise boys and girls than to men, men and women. I might add, it's also less expensive. I want you to join me to create a pathway to purpose for our students. Thank you. Next we have Barbara Roberts. Foster care system for longer than I have. Um, 
thank you for what you've done for the children you've uh, fostered and adopted. And I just can't tell you how important it is to us to have the funding that we need to increase our staff as we need to and keep our level of professionality at a very high grade because the children are so needy and they demand expertise, knowledge, maturity, and we are looking for the best trained staff. I believe we have that now, but we appreciate your funding so we can continue to grow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all that. Give her a hand, would you? Next, we have Rebecca Riggs. Okay. We'll move on to Elaine Stephan. Stephan? away from me that controls my entire body and that's my brain. It's the one organ that can't be transplanted and yet it's the one organ that we don't hear about, that we're not trained in, that we're not taught to love. <coughs> Scott Chevalier has just shared with you the statistics about youth in the juvenile system and the cost of that. Did you know that 70% of the youth in the juvenile system have a mental health issue? <coughs> Did you know that in 2021, there was declared a national emergency in youth mental health? How many of you have family members in the Lake County community? How many of your children actually know how to love their brain? How much is actually given to those children to educate them on their brain? What if I was to tell you that there is already a curriculum out there <coughs> to help from pre-K to undergraduates to learn to love their brain? What if I was to tell you that this is not just a love your brain effort? What if I was to tell you that there is a study that actually tells us that this program, this curriculum called Brain Thrive by 25, supports that Brain Thrive by 25 has a positive impact on individuals' brain functions and classrooms seeking to help students improve patterns of thoughts and behavior highly associated with academic achievement. What if I was to tell you that loving your brain is actually a life development skill? That if we learn to love our brain from elementary school, that we would not have 70% of youth in the juvenile system. What if I was to tell you by the age of 14, 50% of mental health issues <coughs> have actually occurred. What if I was to tell you that in Lake County schools, for the ages between 14 to 25, there has been a 400% in the suicide rate. The numbers is not high. It's gone from two students to 10 students, but that's 400%. Would you want one of your family members to be one of those numbers? So what if I was to tell you that we have a solution 
that we want to partner with the education system, that we want to share the curriculum so that we can embed it in the school system from elementary to undergraduate. What if I was to tell Diane that this program can actually give her undergraduates three college credits? I want to meet with each one of you and those that are responsible for the education of Lake County students so that we can make this happen, so that we together don't have to pay $28,000 a year for somebody in jail. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next we'll have live stream Behavioral Center, John Cherry. Chairman, delegation members, I'm John Chair, CEO of Life Stream and Naval Center uh, here in Lee Square, Florida. I provided you with an executive summary of our two member project request for Lake County for the upcoming legislative session. Life Stream's comprehensive system of care provides all levels of service to all age groups in need of behavioral health care. The state of Florida is responsible for our, the provision of Baker Act services in every county and solicits providers to apply to provide inpatient psychiatric services in a designated Baker Act receiving facility. Lifestream has been the only provider in Lake County counties willing to provide these services and has done so over the past 50 years. Due to inadequate Baker Act funding, we have requested an additional $1.1 million of supplemental appropriations each year for the past eight legislative sessions pay for indigent care associated with Baker Act beds. Uh, thank you for your support in funding our special project appropriations over the past several years. The appropriation funds to seven of 71 Baker Act beds. Our request is for continued support of our 1.1 million special project request to pay, to pay for unfunded Baker Act beds. Our second project this year is a 1.9 million one-time capital request. The state of Florida has indicated the need for more residential beds uh, to address their intent to reduce the utilization of civil beds at the long-term psychiatric hospitals, which are owned and operated by the state. Lifestream has a facility in Leesburg, which could be renovated to provide 32 additional residential beds to serve as an alternative to admission or as step-down beds for individuals determined to need treatment at the state long-term hospitals. Cost of renovation will be $1.9 million, or $59,000 per bed. Lifestream has received capital outlay allocations in the past. Most recently, we responded to the state's need for additional incompetent to proceed, to proceed forensic beds, uh, which resulted in a capital outlay approved by the legislature in the last legislative session. Lifestream appreciates your consideration for funding this 1.9 million capital request. And again, thank you for your support. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Steve Waterhouse. Good morning. <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning. My name is Steve Waterhouse. I'm one of the many faces of Alzheimer's here in Florida as a caregiver for my wife, Gina, who some of you have met, um, and as chairman of the board of the Alzheimer's Association for Central and North Florida. Our state is the epicenter of the crisis for Alzheimer's, the second highest prevalence in the country. Uh, roughly 580,000 Floridians uh, suffer with Alzheimer's, about 13,000 of them here in Lake County. Alzheimer's remains the only top 10 leading cause of death without a viable prevention, treatment, or cure. Now, I know many of you are familiar with this disease and understand that the outcome for those stricken with it is not very positive. However, we have hope. To that end, the Alzheimer's Association will continue to advocate for resources for the care for in, uh, individuals and families and caregivers with this disease. With your support, we will remain relentlessly optimistic as we propose our 2023 legislative priorities.
First, we seek to establish baseline dementia training standards for staff in long-term uh, care facilities. Direct care workers are the lifeline for the people in those facilities, and they need to have the proper training to be able to do the job properly. In addition, that training will reduce staff turnover, increase morale, and improve family satisfaction. Second, we must do a better job of educating the community about the warning signs of Alzheimer's, especially in brain health. Uh, this is very significant since people are unaware of things they can do early in life. This is why advocating for this legislation will require the Department of Health to create the first ever statewide public health awareness campaign that utilizes multiple different media platforms and focuses on those for the underserved communities where actually the odds of getting Alzheimer's are higher. Finally, we ask the legislature to continue supporting for funding of the programs that have a proven track record in research, care, and services for those in need. These include the Alzheimer's Brain Bus, the Ed and Ethel Moore Alzheimer's Disease Research Program, and respite care through the Alzheimer's Disease Initiative and the uh, community care for the elderly through the Department of Elder Affairs. On behalf of the Alzheimer's Association and the over half a million Floridians with their cities and their families, I thank you for this opportunity today and we look forward to seeing you all in Tallahassee on February 7th and 8th during our advocacy days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next we have Catherine Ackerman.
this is basically a provision that would provide that the guardian ward has a right to address end of life care prior to an emergency situation. It's very difficult, um, and there are a lot of horror stories that you may have heard from your other constituents um, to get a DNR. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Next on deck, we have Advent Health. Abel? Please go ahead. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Beery. Beery?
possibly can go back and listen to my voice because it's important because he's new in the state of Florida and only in the state of Florida as a nurse I've been granted a license to kill and it could be any of you or someone you know and love and guess what there's nothing you can do about it let those words sink in for a minute I'm here to request again and this law has been in place for 20 years I am requesting that you finally end the Florida free kill law <coughs> it is only in Florida <coughs> And you combine this law with the COVID protocols that are going on in all our care homes and our hospitals, we have created an environment for legalized genocide. I'm a voice for the voiceless. And I can no longer be part of the system that is continuing this legalized genocide. He really needed to hear this because I'm not sure if he's uh, familiar with subsection 8 of the Florida Free Kill Law. And that's what I call it. I know there's another name, but it is Florida Free Kill Law. Where is the justice and the hope for the victims to rest and for the survivors that cope? I stand here before God and this assembly, true to my hope, and I pray that you all do the same when the time comes to change this law. 20 years is long enough. How many more people have to die? And this is more, this has, honestly, they want to say it's all about insurance premiums. No, it's deeper than that. And it's deeper than the pockets. And I think some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Sabrina Davis. So, um, you guys pretty much know why I'm here. I was hoping that your costs would come back as well. Um, I'll say what I want to say to y'all first. Um, so, my mom was born in this county in 1962. My parents got born, or, you know, born, sorry. And they got married in 1986. I have a lot of history in this county. Um, as you guys know, my dad had pain in his left leg. He went to a hospital. They put him on bed rest. Five days later, he stood up and died. I paid for the autopsy, and the autopsy doctor pulled out a nine-inch long blood clot from my dad's chest. He told me this was preventable, and after calling eight lawyers, they told me because my dad was single and I was at the age of 24, there's nothing I can do. You know, I've heard a lot of people talk about the children today, and one day these children will be 25 years old. One day these children might be single with no kids, and one day these children might fall in this category. And I know you guys care about the children, but those children will become adults one day. And when they're in this category, will you still care about them? Um, I want to recognize Brett McLean for hearing my voice last session. You know, thank you for caring about your children. Um, you know, Rep. Trudell, I'm not here to change your mind. Like I told you that you can do what you want to do. I just ask that when these bills are presented, that you let them be heard. We don't have to have your vote. I respect your opinion for whatever reason. Um, I hope that you're not ever in this position one day, and it's a very hard spot to be in. Um, I wanted to point out that um, my case did go to the Florida Department of Health Board of Medicine. It was heard. The doctor got a fine, and education classes, and a, a risk management as assessment. My dad is dead, I will never get him back. I need my dad at 30 just as much as I needed him at 24. You know, I don't believe this law gives people equal protection, and we have elderly moving here that are widowed most likely, kids with autism or Down syndrome. When they turn 25, they most likely won't get married or have kids. They fall into the category. Um, I, I just hope that you guys let this bill be heard. I rem just remember it could be you or your loved one in my situation. And I want to I wanna end this today with a quote by Representative Roach. 
Um, imagine a doctor. I work for doctors. I love doctors. But just imagine a doctor who's on his lunch break, goes and has a few martinis, and runs a stop sign and kills your 26-year-old child. You can sue them for economic and non-economic damages, but only in the state of Florida. If that same doctor goes and has a few drinks on his lunch break, makes it back to the hospital, and operates on your 26-year-old child, and they die, there's nothing you can do. And ask yourself if that's what you want in Florida. Medical malpractice is very hard to prove. It's not proven by me or family members. It's proven by people in the same expertise as the one who did it. So when it does come to litigation and things like that, it's not an easy thing to prove. It's black and white. And, you know, I think the, the choice here is very easy. Florida needs to do away with this outdated law that became law in 1990. If I can just have 20 seconds to tell Jeff Yarkoski. Florida Statute 768.21, subsection 8. The other three are very familiar with it. It states that if a person dies of medical malpractice and they are single, divorced, or widowed and have no children under 25, you cannot sue the person at fault. My dad died. He was single and 62, a Navy veteran, and I was 30. So they pulled a nine inch blood clot from my father's chest, but because he was single and I'm over 24, there's nothing I can do. I had no idea of this law, and I think it's wrong. We do have bipartisan support. Thank you, Republicans, for being here. But we do have bipartisan support. And um, Senator Ana Maria Rodriguez will be bringing a bill in the Senate again this year. Not sure exactly who's bringing it in the House. Uh, I just want to have you guys support. I know you guys know my story. I'd love to speak with you more sometime. And, um, and thank you for hearing me today. Thank you. Next, we have Deborah McGraw Soden. Good morning. Thanks for having me. It's been, sorry, they really got me going. It's been six years since my dad was killed by a local hospital. It's been six years of me speaking in front of Congress members asking for support in changing the Florida Free Hill Law. I'm in disbelief that this law still exists, and I'm in disbelief that I have to stand here again reliving this. It's a nightmare. My dad went into a local hospital with a broken leg. Several medical errors led to him to bleed to death in front of me. That's an image I'll never get out of my mind. No one in the hospital helped. They left him to die. In the state of Florida, it's cheaper to let a patient die than to fix the medical error that they caused. I stacked towels on his hospital bed because blood was pouring all over the floor. I have videos of everything, a detailed log of events, and I have two sets of medical records, the real ones, that state what actually happened, and the falsified ones that I got after ACCA went in for their investigation. My dad's body went missing, and the state of Florida got involved to find him. It took almost two months to give him a funeral, and to this day, I still don't know if he's buried in the National Cemetery because I was refused of viewing. He was delivered in a minivan from the state and a wooden box nailed shut. I have a view of that too. Aka investigated the hospital and determined they broke laws. Their punishment was they were written up on their website. My dad's cause of death was, was listed as accidental, but in reality, he was legally murdered. Despite all of the solid evidence I have, no lawyer can take my case because of my age. In Florida, bad doctors are protected from their actions. Doctors can lose their license in other states and come to Florida and be protected from their actions. I don't have unlimited funds to donate like special interest groups that protect the bad guys. These doctors get paid for the deaths that they cause and then they go out golfing the next day without remorse or care in the world. 
while families like me and others, our lives are devastated and destroyed. By keeping this law in place, it sends a clear message that money matters more than human life. So here I am, six years later, again asking for someone to care enough to change this unconstitutional and horrific law. The statute of limitations is up on my dad's case, so I'm speaking today in memory of my dad, Randolph McGraw. And because I don't want anyone else in this room to experience the hell that I had to go through, thank you. Thank you. Are we here? Please continue to fully support that and 
fully funded. <clears throat> With the homeless, it's so important because when you get them back to their dignity, get them back on their feet, teach them the life skills, which we're doing every day. Except when you get that one phone call because elements may have beaten on them and we lose them, which has happened over the past couple of weeks. Oh, I lost a couple of my clients. I had just gotten housing for them and I was so excited to be able to take them to it. And unfortunately, the elements outside of the cold blood weather got, got to them. And so they never saw the house. But you know what? They're people and they're your citizens. And we need to help them. You know, we're all one, one paycheck away from being homeless ourselves. Realistically, I mean, let's just be honest. With everything being so high, I mean, it's where it is. And Senator Baxley, you and I have a, a common friend, um, Sherry Meadows. So I know she talks with me frequently about these issues as well. So, so thank I, you for your time. And I just want to say that I brought Sorry. Cheryl here because she went from being the president of the realtors to working for us because this is her passion. <coughs> bring her before because she is the person who continues to try to get people to buy their own houses. Unfortunately, so many of our citizens can't afford housing. She's now trying to work with landlords to get people into housing. And our stock of rentals is just not there to be able to meet the needs of our, our citizens. And so the last one that I'm just going to mention quickly is the request for the LBR to reinstate housing homeless assistance grants. Um, they were around back when I started, which was many, many moons ago. And again, it's just providing additional dollars to help get people into housing, which is what Cheryl's trying to do every day. So I just want to take this time to thank you all for listening to us and hope you have a great day. Have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, we have Paul Owens. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Trunell and delegation members for the opportunity to address you this morning. I'm Paul Owens, <coughs> president of 1,000 Friends of Florida. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization based in Tallahassee, but Central Florida has been my home for more than 20 years. Since 1986, we've been calling for thoughtful planning and ambitious conservation to preserve our environment and quality of life as we grow in Florida. Planning and conservation are especially critical in Lake County, one of the fastest growing counties in Florida. We're pleased to be working with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council on the county's joint planning initiative with 14 municipalities. The priorities I'm going to focus on this morning are made more urgent by the hurricanes that struck our state this year. Ian and Nicole were painful reminders that it's essential for Florida to steer growth toward appropriate areas and away from vulnerable areas. Doing so will save lives, property, and tax dollars and ease the upward pressure on insurance costs. One way of accomplishing this essential goal is to keep investing in preserving natural and agricultural land to buffer our coasts and communities. The last state budget allocated $488 million for land conservation. We'd like to see at least $500 million from the Land Acquisition Trust Fund for this purpose in the next budget, and we do appreciate Chair Trunow's leadership on preserving Florida's wildlife corridor. There are other ways of promoting growth in the right places and avoiding the wrong places. Past legislation like the local bill Representative Fiorkowski described this morning, but make it statewide to add additional protection for vulnerable uh, environmental areas require disclosure of flood history on property sales, raise the standard of state review for any proposed development in coastal high hazard areas or floodplains. We'd like to see the legislature continue its major investments in the past couple of years in community resilience projects, and we compliment the governor for making that a priority. 
and we'd like to see an upgrade in the Florida Building Code to address the risks of sea level rise, stronger storms, and flooding. And finally, we're here again this year to urge you to finish implementing the consensus recommendations of Governor DeSantis' Blue Green Algae Task Force. That includes strengthening basin management action plans, enforcing pest management practices for agriculture, and requiring septic tank inspections. We ask for your serious consideration of these priorities, and we thank you so much for serving this community and our state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, retired Colonel David Pitchett. Pitchett. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Colonel David Pitchett. I'm a I own a small farm here in Lake County with my wife and three small children. I'm here today seeking help from state and county officials to protect small farm uh, rural landowners. I retired from the Army nearly 30 years ago fighting to defend our country as a Green Beret. I'm retired now, or so I thought. However, I find myself in a different kind of battle today, fighting developers over a newly acquired 38 acre plot of land that was timber since the 1970s, surrounded by agricultural small farms on a dirt road here in Lake County. Uh, I'm talking about Edwards Road. Of all the landowners on Edwards Road, only the newest, this developer, who bought an agricultural parcel didn't buy the land wanting it for its current zoning. Uh, they seek to annex it to completely transform this plot of land into a densely packed urban island with 144 single-family homes in the middle of rural agricultural land. The idea that someone can come into a small rural setting that has been unchanged for decades and completely decimate the environment and the neighborhood's way of life is wrong and needs to be stopped. Here are a few action items I hope you'll join me in taking up to help preserve small farms from extinction. One is the future land use determination process. This process needs to include more input from landowners like myself and protection from radical changes by a small minority without the consent of the majority. Today, one land purchase can adversely impact everyone in the area's livelihood, land value, and future. We need more control over outside influences shaping the destiny of our neighborhoods, cities, counties, and state. We need our voices to be heard as part of the decision process. Next, identification and protection of small rural and agricultural areas is needed. I think Orange County is leading the way here through identification and protection of small rural enclave neighborhoods from urbanization through <coughs> annexation changes. Zoning and annex annexation should not be a means for developers to get their desired outcomes regardless of the effects on the rest of the community. We're asking Lake County to work with landowners to identify these small rural areas and potential future enclaves now to provide protection to them as cities develop around them. Next, protection of landowners from forced annexation into towns and cities is another area. Uh, currently, I think there are inadequate safeguards against forced annexation swallowing up small farms and essentially shutting them down. Today, developers also today developers are too friendly with elected officials who will vote on their proposals and make decisions affecting all of us. I was surprised to find a uh, common practice for developers to discuss plans with elected officials in private before the public is even aware of the proposal. We need to prohibit any discussion between developers and elected officials outside of official public venues statewide. Small farms like mine have a mission and it's a labor of love. We provide affordable fresh, fresh items such as eggs, meat, dairy, fruit, vegetables to families throughout the community. Our contributions help struggling families and adults on fixed incomes afford healthy products every day. Today I think we all see how expensive and how difficult it is for our fellow townspeople to pay for food. As ambassadors of our communities, we're asking for your partnership in protecting the future of small rural communities in Lake County. Help us by passing more legislation and ordinances to identify and protect small rural farms. And let's stop the ability to destroy an entire community based on the acquisition of a single piece of land. Thank you for your input. <laughs> Next we have Rick Carlins.
the election was stolen in 2020. And I think that most American people have a, a great distrust for our election system. I'm not talking statistics right now or anything like that, but I know that I have a distrust for it in a profound way, and my concerns are not being addressed. Um, you know, everything that was brought forth was not looked at. And the, the bottom, the point is, when people fear government, there's a problem. When government fears the people, then that's the way it's supposed to be. In a representative republic, that's how we were founded. And we were you know, founded on moral law, uh, which is had been, has been lost. Uh, I don't trust, I don't, I don't trust men in general. I just don't take their word for anything. We have to have election integrity. I'm going to bring it, you know, down locally. I, I poll watched this year, and uh, and it was in Fruit Park. And what I had was somebody came in with four ballots that they were bringing in. That's not legal. Um, you can bring in two and a third one if it falls under certain a certain category of you know who that person is. But so the, I, I talked to the judge of elections, or the, the clerk, it was a judge in Pennsylvania, that's what we used to call him, the clerk. And the clerk, you know, then called up um, the SOE in Lake County and was told to let them drop the four ballots in the box. I made note of that file a complaint. Now, they said that they would sort it out later. There's no sorting that out later when it's in the box with a bunch of other things. That's ballot harvesting and it happened. Early voting is a big problem. Mail-in ballots are a big problem. And the machines, I don't trust. I don't trust that it's counting accurately. There's no proof for that, for me, to make me confident in my elections. And, uh, you know, we, we, the, the way it, that it's supposed to be is I'm supposed to, I want people there that are going to represent my needs. I don't, I don't want to, be, to have them to tell me to be quiet uh, and trust them in doing what's best for me. Uh, you know, I have them represent me, yes, but they're there supporting my, what I want to happen. Uh, or at least along those moral guidelines. And I just uh, just one quote from the founder is, uh, without an understanding of the character and nature of God and absolute truth, combined with the recognition of the sinful nature of the heart of man, and that's it. That's what's taken over. That the purpose for law, government, and justice, without that, governments will always become corrupt and will yield to tyrannical despotism and lawlessness. That's where we're at. So election integrity. We need to get, I didn't even say it, paper ballots. One day, that's it. That's what we have to have. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Next we have Sue Karen. Hey guys. Good morning and thank you for meeting with Lake County residents to listen to our various concerns. I know you guys know who I am except for Stan. I am Sue Parent and I am the president of the Lake County Election Integrity and Border Protection Coalition. We are a grassroots organization of Florida citizens concerned with election systems and processes. Regardless of party affiliation, we believe every legal vote should count as one vote for one person for every election. Uh, most of the delegation here today knows who we are and that we have worked diligently since July of 2020 reviewing publicly available data, legal requirements, and canvassing items related to voter registration in the state of Florida and right here in Lake County. Our work has been directed toward verifying whether fraud occurred during the 2020 general election and from that investigation, we put together a 29-page fraud and failure summary report Excuse me, that has identified statistically significant numbers of false and fraudulent voter registrations and illegal votes cast in that election. It has been reviewed by our own uh, Lake County Sheriff's Department, Director Pete Anchinacci, and from there sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Our factual information was presented in a concise format, and the FDLD is actually currently working on some of the information we provided. We're not allowed, allowed to disclose any specifics that they are investigating, but we want you to know that our findings show viable, actionable failures in our election system. 
And since that report was finalized in May, we continue to work, excuse me, on the, uh, finding the same failures in the 2022 primary and general elections. And although Florida is touted as the gold standard in voting, we have a serious problem with our voter rolls. We are only looking at addresses right now. Conservatively speaking, we just recently found over 900,000 voters on Florida voter rolls that have an issue with just their address. And based on those November voter rolls, we have found over 600,000 voters with residential addresses that are undeliverable as addressed, over 170,000 voters with mailing addresses that are undeliverable as addressed, and over 100,000 voters using businesses as their residential address. In addition to these numbers, we have individuals who have been registered to vote without their knowledge or consent and are facilitated by bad actors through the lack of effective verification process to determine if these individuals are actually eligible to vote in Florida. And once this primary foundational step in the voting system has been compromised, every step that follows is likely to be manipulated for fraudulent purposes somehow. Despite not having access to specialized confidential or internal databases that are used by election officials, ordinary citizens in Lake County have identified these serious and systemic problems in voter registration and election processes. We have been accused of spreading misinformation and lies, I'm almost done, by a supervisor of election when in fact we have given him proof of our findings. His unwillingness to work with us has been voiced by him publicly and he does not want to waste his time talking to us in the future. How are we the voters in Florida supposed to believe there's a gold standard when we can't even get our questions answered? So um, you guys know we're not going away. <coughs> See you in Tallahassee. Thank you very much. Next we have June Lang. Brought some show and tell. Hey. Go, June. <laughs> Um, my name is June Lang, and this is a stack of public records that I received from our state, and they reflect maintenance logs from all 67 counties in Florida, and they are required, all of our supervisors are required every six months to send up to the state a report showing their due diligence of their maintenance logs of what they're doing, and so every six months they faithfully fill out these forms by statute, they build them out. And you can see they're doing their jobs, right? It looks good. You would think that they're doing their jobs until you start looking at these forms. And what you see here is a bunch of zeros. Are they cleaning their job? Are they cleaning their rules? Well, you have categories of um, they can remove people for having an address that is not their residence. You would think they'd find a couple. Oh, and this is two years worth, okay? So you go through <coughs> zero, zero, zero. Nope, zero, 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 zero. They can't find anybody that has an address that's not a legal address. They can't find anybody that's not a U.S. citizen in Florida in two years. Oh, okay, maybe, maybe two, they found two in two years in Florida. So, um, you know, it's a great system until you look into it, and then it's not so great. Oh, and also, you know, Florida's retirement place. Apparently there's about 250,000 people that die in Florida a year, but they don't, according to our supervisors, die in Florida. They must go back up north to die because the, the figures don't pan out here in the deceased column that they're removing. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. They're not removing them. Okay, this is why our roles are bad. Um, so saying that they're cleaned and, and, and removing them uh, is completely different. Um, our coalition has been studying these problems for two years. Um, another issue is the ERIC system that they use. Uh, we, we ran software, the same software that they use, the VCC software, we ran from um, their August of 22 figures. We ran the same software through November of 22's voter data and found 488,000 voters that were moved out of Florida or still on Florida rolls. 
No, we use the same software that Eric is using, but it's still on there. And 21,000 of those voted. So there's nothing more important in my mind than um, the integrity of our votes and of our election system. I'm not asking you for any money. All I'm asking is that when there are legislation that comes up before you, that you sponsor, you work, and you support the works to the good end of bringing good legislation forward and shoring up all these problems. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have uh, Diane Vanetta. Yes, Vanetta. Vanetta. Good morning. My name is Diane Panetta, and I work with the same voter integrity group that you've heard from. Our findings are extremely alarming and should concern every person here. In the state of Florida, our voter rolls have over 611,000 residential addresses that are undeliverable. As you've heard, we have over 170,000 undeliverable mailing addresses. In Lake County, we have over 19,000 fact that our supervisor of elections charged us $2,400 to learn back in September. This same process would have been free if our volunteers had waited until after the elections. Now I realize rules prevent the removal of voters from the rolls within 90 days of an election, but what about the removal of fraudulent votes? Approximately 1,200 votes by mail were counted in Lake County alone from undeliverable addresses this past November. The same addresses where the voter information cards were mailed to and returned as undeliverable this past June due to redistricting. Does anyone in this room want to know how that's possible? I do. Mail-in ballots are the largest source of fraud in any election. This isn't a news flash. The 2005 bipartisan report on election reform commissioned by President Jimmy Carter acknowledged this fact. Mail-in ballots should be restricted to excuse-only absentee ballots, the same way we have done for decades. Added to the election fraud is voting machines. There is no transparency for the average citizen. Very few election workers have the IT experience to understand the machines and instead must rely on the vendor support staff. Our own supervisor, Hayes, admittedly does not know the sensitivity settings for the signature matching. The vendor sets them. This means there are no human eyes scrutinizing these signatures unless they are rejected by the machine. Further, Florida Statute 119.01 paragraph 2C states an agency may not enter into a contract for the creation or maintenance of a public records database if that contract impairs the ability of the public to inspect or copy the public records of the agency, including public records that are online or stored in an electronic record-keeping system for the agency. How does a contract with the voting machine vendors not violate this statute? Vendors claim <coughs> proprietary information to prevent the inspection of their algorithms, hardware, etc. Yet by law, proprietary information is not allowed to impede our inspection of the system. I've been told this is permitted because if the bad actors were able to inspect the inner workings of our election process, they would be able to manipulate the results. Ironic when you consider all computers are hackable. You know what? I know it, and everyone in this room knows that. The solar winds hack in 2020 is proof positive. All computers are hackable. You know what's not hackable? Paper ballots linked to voters who show up in person to vote with a photo ID. An audit process that the average citizen can participate in, witness, and understand. Period. Florida has taken the lead on so many important issues in our country, and I submit there is no issue more important than free and fair elections. It's the bedrock of our republic, the foundation of our freedoms, and I urge you to take the lead on true election integrity this year. Eliminating universal mail-in ballot and electronic voting machines are key to an election process that the citizens can trust. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Jackie Dunn. Good morning. Thank you guys for your time today and for representing our wonderful state. I'm Jackie Dunn. I'm a conservative Republican and I'm here to speak on a 
kind of a sensitive topic, the reintroduction of parole in, in Florida, and the general state of the Department of Corrections. So most people, a lot of people don't realize that parole has not been available in our state since 1983, and Florida has the third largest inmate population in the country. Um, at, what, as he said earlier, $28,000 a year per inmate, per healthy inmate. That doesn't include medical, medical issues or elderly inmates or mental health issues or any other thing that a lot of these, these folks have. Um, so parole um, introduces statistically proven benefits to all of us. And I'm going to talk about three of those today if I can get it in in the next few minutes. So um, number one, parole addresses sentence inequality and excessive incarceration. In Florida, since 1996, the number of 10 year or more sentences have tripled. Um, and that's not just violent criminals we're talking about, nonviolent, violent, anything. Um, there's vast differences in the sentencing um, of a particular individual. They're subjective and they're inconsistent and they're not usually legally based. Um, the incentive, so the incentive to behave, improve, and participate is not there. Right now, the only way that they can get any kind of relief from their full sentence is a 15% reduction if they, it's called gaining time. And, um, and like my son is in prison right now for 19 years for a first offense at age 19. And he'll, what, what incentive does he have? It's going to only take him, you know, half his prison sentence to get to that gain time. So they don't have the incentive to, to, be, to, to be better and do better. And yet he does every single day. He chooses every day to behave. He works hard. He's in the faith-based program, and he does good things for his inmates, his community, his people. He's only been in since March. Um, so, so parole brings a step-down approach and a successful reentry back into the community in a safe and very um, objective manner. So you, you're looking at people case by case, person by person. What have you done to deserve this opportunity to re-enter society safely and in a healthy manner for the people around you? Um, so number two, I'm getting short here. DOC is, the Department of Corrections is operational and financially broken. And I'm going to go ahead and say number three, um, the taxpayers deserve this fiduciary attention. It costs one-tenth um, for someone on parole as it does for them to be incarcerated. And um, there's just a point where the extra incarceration is not doing anybody any good, okay? So um, it, it deserves your attention. The benefits are statistically great and, and too much to ignore. And uh, <coughs> excessive incarceration is meant for people you're afraid of, not people you're mad at. And that's kind of what I live by these days. So please consider it. I'll see you in Tallahassee next week. Thank you very much. Next, we have Kim White. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. As our legislators, you guys are now responsible with, for what happens in the Florida Department of Corrections. The DOC has been and still is in crisis mode. As she said, in the state of Florida since 1996, the number of 10 year or more sentences has tripled bringing the total population of DOC to over 82,000 people. Florida has not built more prisons, and several have been shut down due to being understaffed and insufficient funds to maintain deteriorating facilities. So now we are not overcrowded in existing prisons. They've added extra beds. Most of you already know this. There is still a 20% shortage of staff to work in our prisons, putting both the incarcerated and the staff at risk. We can positively affect the overcrowding and staff shortages by decreasing the number of people affected by overzealous sentencing, especially for first-time offenders. We urge support for training and character programs and sentence reductions, such as increased gain, earn time, reinstituting parole, eradicating minimum mandatory sentencing. These steps will allow our incarcerated people and their families to rebuild their lives and allow the prison system and our communities, because most of our prisons are in rural communities, to function.
and efficiently, financially, safely, and ethically, without jeopardizing public safety. Public safety is important. As a state, we need to create a reasonable release program that keeps everyone safe. Approximately 85% of the prison population will be released one day. We need a mechanism to ensure safe release and low recidivism. Children are affected by the, per, our prison system. I gave you guys a fact sheet that says like 32% of white children, 45% of Hispanic children, and 65% of black children are affected by one or more family member being incarcerated. I would like to ask all your support in the upcoming game good time bill. There is going to be several. They are character building, teaching, faith, and program based programs so that only those people that, who are actively working on bettering themselves will earn game time. With DOC overcrowded and the Florida economy needing workers, these game time bills should help twofold. By relieving overcrowding and filling the jobs our, our economy so desperately needs. And also, I had a paper put in your thanks for visiting prisons on announced in which areas to visit. Okay, now I'm going to change into another person because Candy Kendrick cannot be her mother had an emergency and she had to leave. <laughs> so pretend I look different. <laughs> um, and I probably will not look up at all because I have not read this. Um, my name is Mrs. David Leon Kendrick and my husband whom I am deeply <coughs> proud of is a decorated war veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Having served three tours of active duty in Granada and the Middle East, he was an upstanding member of his community and entrepreneur for the next 10 years of his life. Mr. Kendrick wears a, another uniform now, that of an incarcerated citizen who is serving a life sentence. He did not commit murder. He was not an accessory to murder. He was not an addict, nor did he drink or use drugs or lead a life of crime. He was a regular citizen who made a mistake. This is not to say that all incarcerated citizens should be free. No part of me believes that Mr. Kendrick or any other person who breaks the law should not face consequences and be held accountable for their actions. But shouldn't a corrupt and broken system also be held accountable? Currently, in the state of Florida, our corrections department is consuming tax dollars at an alarming rate, in many cases to fund contingency workforce and emergency needs. Uh, like the, I think she's talking about the National <coughs> Guard being deployed to guard at our prisons. If our prison system was a bridge or a building, we would have condemned it 20 years ago. The structures are crumbling, they are not climate controlled, and they are invested with every manner of rodent and insect known to Florida. Disease is rampant, and there are few infection prevention and control measures taken by clinical staff, so that the common cold, flu, scabies, and other contagious illnesses spread like wildfire, and not just to the incarcerated population. The department cannot make, maintain staff due to working conditions. No one wants to work in an environment that smells of human sweat, urine, feces, and other bodily fluids in an already unsafe environment. In the sweltering heat of Florida with no climate control, and in many cases without even an exhaust fan, no matter how great the retirement package is, people don't want to stay. Right now they're collecting their bonus, I believe, and leaving within six months. Year after year, the issues become worse, and year after year, our representatives overlook criminal justice and prison reform, even as the system is literally falling apart. Florida needs parole, and we need sentencing review panels in every county to compensate for the thing we're almost done. For the, uh, I lost my foot. 
sentencing her new panels in every county to compensate for extreme over-sentencing that has and continues to take place in Florida. Most importantly, why does the Department of Corrections continue to operate as though there is no accountability for abuse and with no virtually with virtually no transparency? We need an independent oversight committee or citizens review board to accurate to perform accurate and thorough oversight of the department. Please do not ignore for another year the dire need for reform in our criminal justice system. It's already too late to address the issues before they become emergencies. So I'm hoping with two of you on our committee for criminal justice, we can um, at least make some changes. Thank you. From <coughs> And for myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, <laughs> too. Next is Alexis Rodriguez. Our wonderful Governor Ron DeSantis has deployed 300 National Guards to help out with the shortage of prison staffs for the next nine months, costing us taxpayer dollars $31 million. State lawmakers called it a band-aid or a patch over a scarred prison system on the brinks of collapse. You cannot continue to ignore this crisis, nor continue nor continue to sweep prison reform bills under the rug because we are now on the edge of a failing system that's now costing our loved ones to live in inhumane facilities. Their food has gotten so bad you wouldn't even feed it to your dogs. Facilities are infested with roaches to the point where they are waking up in the middle of the night to flick off the bugs from their bodies. Our visits are being limited, and it's costing them to live in fear due to the shortage of staff. We currently have one correction officer overseeing 100 inmates. That's an extremely dangerous situation, not only for our loved ones, but for the staff as well. If we think our voting system is broken, outdated, then you can only imagine our justice system here in the state of Florida. Florida is ranked number one in prosecuting children as adults, as young as 14 years old. My son was direct filed at the age of 17 years old, and we are currently living this nightmare. Over the past five years, 446 children have been tried as adults in the state of Florida. Our prison system has many problems and is in desperate need of reform. I am here today to request that you support Bill HB 115, which is the Criminal Rehabilitation Bill, which was submitted on January 4th of this year. This bill aims at reforming Florida's criminal justice system. We will continue to organize, we will continue to unite and grow, we will continue to contact you endlessly and email you as well. Because we are the voices of our children. We are the voices of our loved ones that are behind bars, who are stuck in this broken system. We voted you in and expecting change, and we will use our votes if we don't see such change. The time is now. The big question is, what are we planning to do come July? When the nine months are up, are we going to spend another $31 million of our tax taxpaying dollars? I ask that you contact your colleagues, make them aware of this crisis in the prison system in Florida that we are currently having. And also, I ask Senator and your colleagues to do a pop-up visit at any of our local um, prison facilities and take a look at first hand of what we are expressing here today so you can better understand. Also, before I close, just wanted to let you know that, it, like mentioned before, it's $2,800 per Per inmate per year that it's costing tax payments? Huh? 28,000. 28,000. Okay, so we're talking about almost a billion dollars a year 
to house the incarcerated. So I think it's you know time that we go ahead and we make some changes and we not sweep any more reform bills under the rug. Thank you so much for your time and um, Taylor, thank you um, for your great um, running here in, in Lake Mignola. We really supported your 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 campaign. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Karen Sutton. She couldn't make it, she had to go to Volusia. Okay. Do we have any more presentations? Yeah. Mr. Chair, while we're transitioning, I would like to just comment that's been a very big part of my life is both taking children that were abused and also seeing into the brokenness of life in so many places. I have been in over 100 prisons, and many of them were not in house visits. Uh, it's a very big challenge. And, and, um, but yes, we bring a lot of specific issues to them, and we're also looking at much broader issues. And um, it probably would be good if you would help people know who's carrying these bills if you already are tied in. Uh, I'm not. I think David Smith is going to carry a, a yeah. game time bill. I yeah. told you that though. Didn't yes, you yeah. told me. But a lot of people told my wife tells me something about every five minutes, <laughs> and I'm not up to speed. And which is why I have uh, a great staff. I, I, I want you to meet um, my team uh, before we shut down today. But you might want to do that later. Okay. Be sure you meet our staff members because I won't remember everything. If you want to make sure I heard it, tell me. If you want to make sure it gets followed up, uh, Matt McLean, our team, will help do that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator. So we have uh, a few more appearances here. We have Rachel Donnelly. Is she still here?
that they don't read these emails that they receive so many of them I would have to direct my complaints elsewhere. I have sent several um, emails to the Department of Corrections. I have gotten some response. Um, I still do receive the calls and the reason I accept the calls is because I'm, they are on a recorded line is what I'm told and I want it as a witness of being this harassment and, and to see if anything can get done. My daughter-in-law and my grandchildren have recently left the state of Florida in the night because of this in fear of their life. None of my family wants to visit me in fear of their lives. This is due to the lack of justice in our judicial system, and I think it needs to be looked into. I thank you for your time today. Thank you. Next, we have Patty Grinnell. your time. I appreciate you fitting us in. I do live and I vote in Lake County and until recently I was employed by the Lake County School District but as of last May I retired and I originally thought I was going to get up here and tell you all the whys but you've heard a lot of the reasons that are uh, afflicting our teachers and why they're leaving and why we can't fill the 9,000 vacancies in the state so I'm not going to go into that because it's pretty much out there. But I do want you to know that I am an activist, and so I want you to remember this face because I will be in Tallahassee at some point and to pursue um, activism for, on behalf of our teachers. Um, I was one of 300 who stepped down last year, but I'm probably the only one who's still in the fight because I am the County Educator Association retired teacher. So I get up and I speak out when I have something I need to say. And if you remember the rally in Tally about three years ago, some of you I think were still in office, um, I was there. You might remember me, I was very red. So um, I just want you to no notice that the union of teachers plays a big role. And if we lose our union, if we use our, or lose our freedom, this is going to contribute to the lack of highly um, trained and impacting teachers because now they'll lose their vote. I just want you to know this past semester as a retired teacher, as someone who still promotes our union, I went around to most of our Lake County schools to visit and to see what's going on and to encourage, and in some cases, to offer support in the special education department because that was my expertise. There's a real disconnect between what they need and what they're getting. But I heard a common theme and they are all exhausted and they're all tired of waiting for the respect to come as veteran teachers. Did you know that? What I want to say is there's a disconnect between Tallahassee and our teachers in the trenches right now. I want you to remember that word disconnect because what you think is happening when you pass these laws and these legislations that you think are helping teachers. They might be helping a few but they're not helping everybody. And I realized that at age 65, I wasn't going to live long enough to get the respect and the salary I deserved. So I went ahead and, and stepped down. But I'm still fighting for teachers and what they need. And I want you to consider this, that our Governor DeSantis is promoting the elimination of the Dues Deduction Act. And this, if this goes through, and if you're on that committee, and you allow this to go through, and it disconnects the teachers from their union, God help you. Because we are the voice of teachers. And if you take away that voice, God help you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next we have Manny Joe. Two of you know me well. Um, I've been 
writing a blog on fiscal issues in the county for close to 15 years, uh, make videos, including at this meeting, and many before this, and city councils. I've been to all 14 city councils, uh, go to the county board meetings, the water district, etc., etc. And the one big trend that I see that you could maybe work on, and I would really implore that you select some of the issues that I've given you this on, on this paper, uh, and just work on fixing it, okay? My view is that the state passes a lot of laws. A good example is Chapter 723 on mobile home uh, owners and uh, their, how they're supposed to follow dealing with their tenants who rent lots. And it's full of loopholes. It's full of uh, it, the department. The law says that the local people, the sheriff, the county, the city, cannot do anything about complaints from residents in these homes who own the home. It can be an over. And they pass, and, and they get uh, uh, their rates go up. It's going up even worse. I'm getting calls because I've written articles on my blog, people find it when they're searching for help, uh, and the, these, about 5 to 10% of the mobile home park owners are predators, and they do what they can to force and harass elders, veterans, uh, people out of the home just through harassment, Use, issuing fake eviction notices to harass them issuing fake uh, demands that they do something on the home, etc., etc. I've got a document. I've got several videos. Uh, I've talked to, early on to uh, Senator Baxley. I'll be back. I have more. And the, 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 my view is that this state is what I call a huckster state. I have a whole article on my blog of just huckster, huckster issues where the states have created something like, for instance, this grandiose election integrity um, committee that the governor for $50 million. I have one guy and one staffer and no more. Didn't spend any of the money. The one guy that had a heart attack with an argument with the Secretary of State, that's after talking to some of the people here who have the evidence. They gave you, you heard it. You know, uh, the regulations that uh, uh, cover the uh, constitutional officers, including the uh, superintendent of elections, he's ignored an awful lot of things and he claims he doesn't have to do it because there's all these loopholes and vague generalities in those statutes. I really will fo be following up with you, but you've got this list of things that I think need to be corrected. Uh, Everybody loves our governor, but the rest of you have to follow the line. If you watched the hearings up in Congress, uh, the House, and how people are so angry and mad at what they call the establishment coming in, and a couple of you are here because you had establishment backing, uh, and you need to start working on fixing these things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Elizabeth. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Trunow, Representatives, and Senator Baxley for the opportunity to speak today. I also want to thank you for your willingness to serve our community. I'm a lifelong Lake County resident and a product of Lake County Public Schools as well as the University of Florida. I care deeply about this community, which is why when I graduated, I came back to Lake County to teach in Lake County Public Schools. In fact, some of my amazing former students are in this room. I, um, for the past year, I have served as the Vice President of the Lake County Education Association, and with this position, I've had the incredible opportunity to visit and speak with educators and community members from Umatilla to the villages to Four Corners. I have seen our educators work tirelessly to ensure our students have the opportunities and education they deserve, but they need our support. We have many classrooms and positions without consistent, highly qualified educators. This negatively impacts the workload on our educators and the opportunity for our students to have the education they deserve. Working conditions and salary have the biggest impact on retention and recruitment. 
Our ability to recruit and retain educators has been greatly impacted by legislation that has prevented continuing contracts as well as dictated how compensation can be distributed. Our veteran educators who mentor and support our early career educators have been impacted by policies that have given them less performance pay than new educators. Experience and education is Experience and commitment to serve our community should be rewarded by providing continuing contracts and competitive compensation for all educators. I would love to meet and continue this discussion with each of you so that we can develop solutions to provide the world-class public education our students deserve. Thank you for your leadership and support of Lake County Public Schools. Thank you very much. And lastly, we have Tessa Clark. my team up, uh, up here that I have the honor of, of serving with that 
you know, everything we talk, you guys all talked about today is very important to us all. And, you know, don't think that just because something doesn't move this year or last year or, or whatever that we don't care and we're not working on it. I can tell you there are thousands of forces at work in every silo that you guys came up and testified on. And, you know, Senator Baxley has a lot more power than I do. Everyone has different levels of, of, of um, you know, of influence. And, and we all, but we're all coming together as a team here to really dive into these issues. And I can tell you mental health and addiction is a very important thing to me. Um, as a former drinker myself, you know, uh, I think it's important that, that we get up and testify and we tell our story. And I was very vocal about that. So I have a lot of respect for the folks in that world. Uh, that spills into the criminal justice world. I believe criminal, you know, public safety is the most important function of government. And obviously, if we can put some real horsepower over there and fix some of those things, you know, that, that makes a big difference to our sheriff and our police chiefs. Uh, so I appreciate uh, those efforts, the, 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 the youth, you know, Scott, you're a good man, and what you're doing with, the, with those organizations is fantastic. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. And then uh, the lady that just spoke about the trades, I'm a contractor, plumber, grew up on the farm. I think you're so right. That's what this country was built on, is the trades and the vocational. And, and I've been working you know, with, uh, with Lake Tech, and uh, work, there's a lot of great things in the works there here. We all believe in, in, those, uh, in, in those skill sets. And we need to make it uh, you know, not looked down upon to, to go into those areas. We need to restore that and bring the integrity back in those professions, and that's something that I am passionate about. So I uh, just want to thank you all. I want to tell you that I'm drinking from a fire hose right now, but I'm loving every minute of it. I'm not to quote Loverboy, one of my favorite rock bands, but, uh, but I'm excited about the work that, that is coming here, and, and we're going to be digging in. And like Senator Baxter said, you know, my staff is amazing, his staff, all of our staff. We wouldn't be where we are without him. So please make sure you reach out, because we see everything I do. I attend to it, and it's important to me. I can't fix it if I don't know about it. So God bless you all, and thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank, thank, thank you Chairman. Members, it, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here to uh, hear your challenges and your concerns. Being a part of three, two other delegations, and certainly haven't been in the process for a period of time. I was in local government. I was a county commissioner in Marion County for 12 years, and um, so I have certainly most of the challenges and concerns that you have are the same challenges and concerns that most uh, folks have. Yours may have some unique uh, uh, facets to it, or something like that. But most of them are from the same for all the citizens that I have represented in. Look forward to working with these these gentlemen and uh, making sure that uh, your challenges and concerns will try to do the best we can. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Chairman. You're very patient with me and getting jumpy and moving ahead and wanting to respond to a lot of things we hear. But the more we're quiet, the more we get to hear. And uh, I cannot thank you enough for coming and sharing the things that are on your profile of seeing firsthand and bringing firsthand accounts. Um, there is a lot we do, but there's always more to be done, and the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Um, try, try to control your emotions. This is a self-instruction uh, that I do at, at the office, too, because sometimes it just seems like I can't give any of that mountain to move. And you get so misunderstood on so many fronts. <clears throat> But if you care about the future, and you've got a bunch of kids like Jeanette and I do, and you've got grandkids and kids now that are teachers and lawyers and doctors, and, and some of them are kids with disabilities and real, real trials that, to try to achieve what they do. But it's inspiring. We live in a country and a place where it can still happen. And so don't, don't think we didn't hear this. And don't think there are many, many parts to the puzzle as we work on these different aspects. To stay in dialogue with us, we're doing a lot of uh, applications for things that need funding in different areas here. A little bit of money helps. It's not all about money. It's about doing the right policies. But <clears throat> as you know, it does take resources to make things work. So 
We're going to keep working on that. I, I won't ever get you happy on every single issue and every, every single way that I approach it, but I fully respect that you're coming with a sound reasoning of where you see the world from and where you're working and the challenges that you're helping to meet. So, as long as we keep this many people that heavily engaged, we will get some of it done every year. But I want to make sure, Matt, why don't you step up this way? This guy is like my right arm. Yeah. I'm not kidding. If you can get to follow your issue with him, he's helping me follow hundreds of issues that we work with. I work for you. I don't really work for the government. I work for you. And it's been a tremendous pleasure the last six years to be your senator. And I'm sure we didn't get it all right to everybody's uh, evaluation. But you brought so many issues to the table that we've turned and looked at different ways and continue to work on. So particularly if your organization or your interest is filing uh, some appropriation requests, uh, I'm going to try to really put some effort onto those concerns here. Uh, this could be my best opportunity and time to work on that for you. And for my, my colleagues, these are good people. They have plenty to do. They don't need a job. They have a problem, like you do, for something that you care deeply about and that needs your attention. So I hope you'll give us a little room to know that that is where our heart is, even if we don't always come to full understanding. But that's the nature. That's why we have a wonderful government like this, where you can be a part of that. Uh, also, Penny's here. So Penny's usually the one to answer the phone. She's really nice. She's a lot more patient than I am. And uh, she keeps me more patient. But you also, will, they will help you. These teams, these legislative teams, are the ones who will keep your stuff on the radar as we're pushing through. And it seems like quite a zoo. Just, just have a big family and ride the wave. It's, 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 a, it's always a mixed up time, right? But still, you learn to write that and figure out when is the best time to move on different things. Your issue will come. Your issue will touch. It may not do exactly what you want, but you'll be amazed at some of the things that you will see happen if we keep talking. Thank you. Thank you for the I just want to say I'm honored to be the chairman this year and honored to be back in the legislature and working with with representatives and senators like we have at this delegation. Uh, we're willing and able to work on the issues and do things that make Florida a better place like we all have tried to do in our last few years. And Representative Joe Karski will have a jump in with both feet and start running. Um, we appreciate your input, your time that you spent to come here today and a lot of you this is, this is very important to us, and again, our, my team, Eric and Aileen, um, are, there's three of us, but there's one of us, right? We have, we work together to, to solve the issues, the constituent issues that we have here, and um, listen to what you have to say and, and try to make a difference. So, I look forward to many years to, to help and, and be a product of prosperity and, and, and guidance moving forward in the legislature. Thank you all for attending today. Look forward to seeing you again. Good.